The Honorable Congressman John Conyers Jr. was a statesman, leader, and civil rights icon. He was elected to the U.S. Congress in 1964 and re-elected for a total of 26 times more, serving in Congress for 53 years. During his 53 years in Congress, he built a reputation as a champion for civil and human rights. He was a political giant and a strong advocate for the African-American community. He was a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus in 1969 and considered the dean of that group. He was the first African-American to serve on the House Judiciary Committee. He sponsored several important bills affecting civil rights, including the Martin Luther King Holiday Act the Motor Vehicle Act, the National Voter Registration Act, and the Hate Crime Statistics Act. He was the third longest serving House member in U.S. history and the first African American to hold the title of Dean. He was uncompromising in his causes and demand for fairness, equity, and respect within the political process. He walked alongside and worked with the giants of America's 20th century leaders who advanced the civil rights movement like President Lyndon Johnson, President Bill Clinton, President Barack Obama, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, and others. But in 2017, he came under fire when three women accused him of sexual harassment. Unbelievably, his so-called longtime colleagues and friends called for his resignation, despite the fact that Congressman Conyers absolutely denied the charges and had numerous witnesses to support him. Nancy Pelosi called for his resignation. It was the ultimate betrayal to the reputation and the legacy Congressman Conyers had built for 53 years. The Dean of the House, the civil rights icon, was being convicted in the media without affording him his constitutional due process rights, which every American is guaranteed under the 5th and the 14th Amendments to the Constitution. Due process rights afford every citizen the right from arbitrary denial of life, liberty, or property by the government outside the sanction of law. Arnold Reed, an esteemed lawyer and well-known supporter of Congressman Conyers, step forward to vigorously defend Conyers' honor, his reputation, and his legacy. He investigated each accusation and found each allegation to be unsupported and refuted with sworn affidavits. Here is attorney Arnold Reed on national TV vigorously defending Congressman Conyers. He will continue to defend himself until the cows come home because unequivocally, unmitigatedly, he is indicating he has not sexually harassed anyone. Congressman Conyers should resign. Uh, as Dean, Congressman Conyers has served our, our Congress for more than five decades and shaped some of the most consequential legislation of the last half century. However, zero tolerance means consequences for everyone, no matter how great the legacy. First of all, it is not up to Nancy Pelosi Nancy Pelosi did not elect the congressman, and she sure as hell won't be the one to tell the congressman to leave. A new woman has come forward today. Her name is Eliza Grubbs. She signed she's not an new. affidavit. She's not new. She's not she's, new. Okay, and well, we have she signed another this affidavit, affidavit here. I just saw the affidavit here. We have accusing, another affidavit here that accusing. counters Ms. Grubbs. Well, we let me get a, into uh, what she's I'll, accusing the we, congressman of doing. I know what doing. she's accusing the congressman well, of. Well, our viewers don't. And She's this is an affidavit that reviews her. her in She's accusing him of groping her. She's a witness, and in she church. is Marion Brown's cousin. She is the cousin of Marion Brown, who was hired by the congressman, who supposedly all these things happened to, and now she's just coming out. She was fired by the congressman. Marion's daughter was fired by the congressman. I've had conversations with Marion's employees or co-workers at the airline she worked for. They're willing to come in, if need be, and testify that she is an opportunist and takes every opportunity to get in front of the uh, camera. So let's so, not so mislead your critic, viewers. Critics would this say, is sir, not that new. John Conyers sounds exactly... New. Well, truth says that Mr. Conyers has not done anything, and that's characteristic of the truth versus a lie. The li a lie you have to tell over and over and over because you can't remember from one day to the next what you say. The truth, Carol, stands one time because that's all you have to tell it. Lisa so, so Bloom the, and these accusers. So if that's Lisa true. Lisa Bloom and these accusers. Why, why didn't, why didn't Congressman Bloom, Conyers subject himself to an ethics 
investigation by the House of Representatives instead of retiring. Then he could have just because the course, congressman so has retired, you're making suppositions here and you don't know. Just because Mr. Conyers has retired does not remove an ethics investigation. That does not obliterate an ethics investigation. Where are you getting that from? Okay, so is there going to be an ethics investigation conducted on Congressman Conyers? You'd in the have House? to ask the ethics attorneys and you'd have to ask the individuals of the OCE that's responsible for that. It does not automatically wipe away an investigation. Let's make that clear for your viewers. Congressman Conyers has indicated from day one that he is not guilty of these allegations. A number of individuals I've spoken to uh, have said that he that they've been in that office 20, 30 years. These allegations did not happen. In this insider exclusive network TV special, John Conyers, the proud legacy of the Dean of the U.S. House of Representatives. Our news team visits with Arnold Reed, his family, and key staff that served on John Conyers' staff to discuss the unique aspects of this case and the legal challenges they faced. Arnold Reed made America aware and understand that just because a person is accused by one or more accusers does not mean that that person is in fact guilty. Now America clearly recognizes due process. People in America understand the importance of due process and not rushing to judgment when one is accused of wrongdoing. Congressman Conyers, at Arnold's suggestion, retired in 2017. Because of the bold and courageous efforts of Attorney Arnold Reed, Congressman John Conyers' legacy is intact and will be enshrined in the proverbial tabernacles of time. Arnold Reed fought for him when no one else would, and because of him, he will go down as one of the greatest political leaders in the free world. Legacy preserved. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Detroit. It is my great pleasure to introduce Arnold Reed and his wife and partner at his law firm, Harolyn Beverly Reed. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I want to welcome you to be on the show today because w this particular case that we're going to be talking about today rep is about the dean of the U.S. House of Representatives, John Conyers, and how your firm, both of you, stood up against all odds and tried to, and successfully, protect his legacy. Um, tell our audience, and I'll go to each one of you, Arnold, what this case meant to you. This case meant so much, not only to me, but to, to America. We had a movement, and, and uh, the Me Too movement, of course, it's one of the prolific, most prolific movements in, in history, which was necessary. And the way that I viewed it is, as important as it was, it was equally important to defend someone who said they didn't do it, who said that I'm innocent and I want to stand my ground. And I felt that it was our job not to get mired down in the he say, she say, but to fight for someone who maintained their innocence. That's what this country is all about. And so that is why, in my view, this was one of the most significant cases in modern history. In the early stages of the Me Too movement, um, give you an example, Al Franken, a lot of the pillars of the Democratic Party, as soon as you were accused, you had to resign your office, change your whole life. What did you think about that? I believe in due process. I believe in having the opportunity to assess the facts from all angles. Um, I believe that the cancel culture, which is prevalent now, um, is not necessarily a good thing. Um, I believe in assessing the facts and looking at the landscape and just immediately in the press saying, it, you're guilty. That's not, that's not the place for that. That happens in a courtroom. It doesn't happen in a press box. 
So, um, no. And I thought it important that we protect uh, a strong legacy and that we handle the matter appropriately and properly and expeditiously. This was a controversial case. There was obviously some backlash. What was that? Oh, wow. I mean, it's like, where do we begin? Do you have enough time? I mean, phone calls. What did they say? You name it. The N-word. Why are you doing this? You know that SOB is guilty. And then there's social media, all right? It's so easy for somebody to sit behind a keyboard and you can't even see them. So you have the social media, you have uh, newspaper reporters uh, trying to bait me into saying that it's a race issue as opposed to just the uh, right and wrong, Steve. So you, you are faced with these issues from all sides in these comments. And then, thank God, there's people that you run into that say and give you that reaffirmation that you're doing the right thing. You're fighting not only for the congressman, you're fighting for my son, my son attorney reader. You're fighting for my nephew, attorney Reed. And so in spite of all the negativity, all the bad things that were said, right, we get reaffirmation that we were fighting for justice and doing the right thing. You know what? I do it all over again tomorrow. Yeah. We looked at um, the documents that you sent us regarding you discovered there were many witnesses that came forward that denied these charges, these allegations of these people. Right. There were three women, exactly. And I remember one of the women said that he talked mean to me. Well, you know, to me, I, I, I don't think that's a crime, is it? I don't know. <laughs> but you had a number of witnesses that came forward. You had affidavits, right? What did they say? These affidavits were, first of all, from people who worked in that office and had an intimate understanding of the alleged accusers and the congressman. And they said that they witnessed nothing like that. What they did say was that at least one of the accusers was upset because the congressman uh, took action against her for stealing and for doing other things relative to her job that were untoward. For example, they had a turkey drive. Instead of taking the turkeys or wherever they were supposed to be, she took them and a home and sold some of them, things of that nature. And so we had numerous witnesses who were there every day. This is not somebody there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This is every day, all day, and said it never happened. But of course, the media didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear that, Steve, right? Because they're into he say, she say, she say, she say. And that was the problem. We represented uh, Tavis Smiley in D.C. in his case against PBS. I was the lead trial strategist. The jury said that the reason that they voted against him because it was he say, she say, she say, she say, and she say. We've got to move away from that and have a situation where a person gets their due process, their constitutional rights. And quite frankly, I don't care if a hundred people say you did something. You still are entitled to the protections that the law affords. We hear the name John Conyers. He spent 53 years in Congress. Let's talk about who he was. He was elected in, I think, 1964. He was a founding member of the Black Caucus, correct? Uh, he was considered the dean of the House of Representatives, the first African-American, correct? What else should America know about him? John Conyers was a family man. John loved his wife, loved his children. He was not interested in money at all. In fact, John told me one day, Arnold, I have the best job in the world. And voice, he would say, Arnold, lean over a little bit and talk. I have the best job in the world. And I said, what are you talking about, John? You don't even make six figures barely. How is that a good job? I get to talk to the people. I get to help people. And that was John's thing. He didn't care about the money. What people don't know is, I mean, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Portier, all of, all of the famous people, black and white, when they came here, they wanted to see John Conyers. They wanted to write books, do movies about John. John wouldn't do it. He had about a dozen offers. He turned down every one of them because money did not motivate him. Sometimes I tease him and say, John, heck, you're crazy, man. Can we do a movie about your lawyer? He would always laugh at that, but he was not interested in money at all. 
John Conyers was the proverbial David slaying the Goliath of racism, inequity, and the ills that plague us as a people. That's who John Conyers was. I looked at back at his record, and he's been involved ever since 1964 civil rights movement with Lyndon Bain Johnson, presidents all the way up to Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And he just had an amazing career. He's kind of like the behind the scenes guy that made sure legislation was passed, right? No question. The only time you see him in front of the scenes was during the riots here where he's standing on top of that truck with the bullhorn. Other Very than, courageous. John was behind the scenes making it happen. Now, the, there's a lot, there were a lot of accusations. Um, how did you resolve this case? We fought very hard. One of the major things was is to have John actually testify. We had a private conversation. He said, Arnold, I want to fight this for as long as we possibly can. And he was 88 years old at that at time. At that time. Well, it took a toll on John's health. He was hospitalized a few times. And his doctor basically said, this may kill him. This may kill him. And we had to make a decision. We had to make a decision on whether we would continue to push for an open hearing or were we going to look toward John stepping down, maintaining his reputation, maintaining his pension, everything that he worked for. And so the focus changed after John was hospitalized for several days and we prevailed in the end. John retired with his name intact, his reputation. His legacy. His legacy was preserved, exactly. His full pension, everything. So it was a victory. We're very proud of that. To both of you, this might be probably one of the most important cases where you represented someone who really deserved justice, right, Harlan? Yes. I, I fully believe that he deserved uh, justice. And I remember saying to Arnold, we have to do what we need to do to protect this man and his legacy. I'm raising children. He is someone who uh, I've made sure my children understood who he was in history. And uh, it's important to me that when we have uh, men, African-American men who have done well and have created a, a body of work that is respectful, um, that, that we protect that. I understand we have your daughter with us, Arlen. Let's bring her on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Arlen Reed to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I understand that you had to experience a lot of the backlash in this case, right? Yes. What was that? I was in college at the time, and obviously this was a high-profile case. A lot of my classmates would come up to me, make various comments. They'd like, want, like what? They would make comments like, how could your dad represent someone who sexually assaulted um, a woman? How could, how could he do this? Um, and wanting to know the various details of the matter. And, and I wouldn't say anything. Um, I understand that this is a high profile situation. People are going to say what they want to say. They're going to say what the media tells them. But I was always proud of my father. Um, and I, under I know that he believes in due process. Um, everybody has a right to due process. And so uh, there was even a, a caricature made on Twitter, um, a, a very negative caricature made on Twitter. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was not positive. Um, and so dealing with that was difficult, but of, of your dad, of my dad. Yes. Um, and so, but my main role was to support him and sort of keep it moving and understand, um, that things aren't always what they seem. This, um, you were in law school at the time. I was in college. At you the were time, an undergrad yeah. at Sorry. the time. Um, but I would assume that many of your, your fellow students were also pre-law, correct? Some of them, a few of them, yes. Did you have to explain to them what due process means? They weren't really focused on that. They, in, when, in terms of getting to the minutia, to the details and all that, they don't really pay attention to all that. It was more so surface value with them. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I just would let them talk. Um, people are going to think what they want to think, and uh, things will flesh themselves out through the legal system. You know, I'm amazed when I talk with people. I've learned one thing. You're never going to change anybody's mind. Exactly. Let them talk. Let them believe what they want, you know. But the bottom line is they just need to talk. And unfortunately, with social media today, everybody has a voice. Yes. And unfortunately, it influences people who, we'll get back to this word again, that adjective decidedly decided to be ignorant. 
to remain ignorant, right? Um, this experience, what has it done for you with the successful conclusion of this case? Well, it's really taught me a lot, and I think law school has helped me um, reflect on this situation as well. A, a few things. Analyze every situation. Things aren't always what they seem. There's so many intricacies and complexities of the law and the legal system. And the media will tell you one thing, but there's always the ins and outs um, on the other end that don't get publicized. Mm -hmm. And we believe in the Constitution and due process, and I, I believe in analyzing every situation as it comes. And so I've definitely learned a lot from this situation. Mm -hmm. Any parting words to America? in whenever anybody is accused of anything about giving them a fair chance to represent themselves. Well, and you said it just there. When, whenever anyone's accused of anything, they have a right to, to be heard. They have a right to present their evidence and the facts. Um, and so we need to, you know, see that through the legal system. So that's what, I, that's what I would tell America. One of the other things I learned about this case was, you know, John was a pillar in the Democratic Party. And you saw people like Nancy Pelosi um, and the Black Caucus, right, turn their back on him, right, when they should have stood up for him because of due process. I mean, they're legislators, right? They understand the Constitution. I was really disappointed with that, weren't you? Exactly. One of the things that really, really disheartened me is an organization that he founded, they turned on him. You had people calling me on the phone asking me, is he going to resign? Can I make him resign? Can you make John leave? And I'm saying, no, we're going to fight this out and don't call me anymore. <laughs> People showing up at his funeral, giving these eloquent speeches, and I'm sitting there because John was my friend. John was really my friend. And watching them say these wonderful words and saying to myself, okay, now this person called me asking me, when is he going to step down? They didn't, they didn't know who I was, and they were calling my office. And at the end of the day, I would talk to my kids about that. And one of the takeaways from this whole thing is we don't run away from anything, not at Arnold D. Reed and Associates PC. If there's justice to be gotten, we will get it. And if there's a fight to get into, we will get in it. We're not going to start it, but we damn well will finish it especially when it's a good man like John Conyers. Any client would love to hear that because a lot of law firms don't believe that. You get in the fight, you're in the fight through thick and thin, right? Oh, it's no question about it. The backstory is this. When the pressure comes to bear on the cases that we have on your family, when you leave that office and you come home at 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night and you open that door and walk in your house, you can't let your job in first. You've got to come in first and then get back at it the next day fresh. And that's what we do. We stand for our clients like a line of cliffs against a tempestuous tide, never wavering, never giving up. Because without justice, this is not America. This is not a civilized society. And we will never surrender and never move off of that steed. Admirable words. I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you. You've learned a valuable lesson how your dad and his office invest their time and everything they have Sorry. in a case to represent someone successfully. We also have with us your son. So we're going to bring him on, Arnold, and a top congressional aide, Yolanda, that I mentioned earlier on the show. So let's bring them on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Arnold Reed II and Yolanda Lipsy to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. I understand you both worked with Congressman Conyers, right? You were a top congressional aide for, what, 12 years? Correct. And you were an intern there. I was. What did Congressman Conyers mean to both of you? And I'll start with you, Yolanda. Um, there were a plethora of things that he meant. Uh, he was a legend in his own right, um, you know, a, a bit of walking history. So he was someone that um, I had great admiration for. And you could, he was the type of person you can learn a lot from in, in very different aspects of you know, the type of work that he did. Besides being a great legislator and besides being an icon in the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. was he a good storyteller? 
Absolutely. Yeah, he'd yeah. always bring you in and tell you some great yes. story. Yes, we would like to, or at least I did, enjoy sitting by, you know, his footsteps, so to speak, and just listen to the to the history, the wealth of the history. And he could remember things. He had a memory like an elephant. And he could remember and, and recollect on things that happened from, you know, the time he first entered politics up to, you know, that present day. And it was just always astonishing. Some of those things you would read in a history book or, you know, heard by way of others. But you got to relive it as he told the story. And you were an intern there for how long? I was an intern there for a summer and it was an amazing summer. Um, he was an amazing mentor, a great role model. Um, and something that I remember about him is every single morning I would bring him some of his newspapers. He would read three or four newspapers. And at any point in the day uh, when he wasn't so busy, he would come and he would talk to the interns and ask about, hey, what did you think about what's going on in the world? And you could have the most lively conversation with him. You could ask him, hey, what was on page uh, B26 of the paper? And he knew it. He would read the paper from front to back. And so he really just taught me that when you're trying to learn something about the world, have to do your research, you have to do your homework, and you have to do it consistently. Yeah. Now, when he was in Congress for 53 years, mm -hmm. um, when these allegations came out, these false allegations, what was your initial reaction? Because you, you, you knew him more, okay. better than most people. Okay. What was your reaction? It was heartbreaking. You know, I didn't feel that he deserved that type of did you know the women that were making these accusations? Some I knew, some I didn't, yes. And they had been former employees? Yes. Okay. What do you think their motivation was for coming forward? There was definitely a motivation. Um, some were being vengeful, in my, my opinion, and others were just seizing the moment. Mm -hmm. One of them said that he spoke mean to them. I didn't know that was a crime, but... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or classified as sexual harassment or whatever. When you heard some of these allegations, what did you think? I was extremely shocked and surprised. Um, Any time that I had been around the congressman in his office, the atmosphere was welcoming. It was a home-like atmosphere. Totally foreign, yeah. these accusations. Now, you're a lawyer, yes. and you're well aware of due process, and you're well aware in the beginning of the Me Too movement, a lot of people were taken out, if you will, that maybe shouldn't have resigned so quickly. What was your feeling when and you being in the office there for 12 years, what was your feeling when some of the top Democrats wouldn't stand behind, John? Legislators are too busy trying to be politically correct than to stand for what's right. You get some that do and some that don't. So again, that, that was equally as heartbreaking, especially those that had long rela long time relationships with him, that knew him. And, um, you know, it, it just... Um, it was somewhat baffling. Disappointing. And very disappointing, yes. To, to, at the very least, stand up for the person that you knew or had, you know, a long-term working relationship with. You felt probably the same way? Yeah. I, it was very interesting to see how a lot of people in Washington who had known him for years mm -hmm. were the same ones who didn't ever come to his side at his moment of need. And it really just goes to show what people in Washington really value and what they don't value. And so that was very shocking, very surprising for me to see, especially because, like I said, I knew Congressman Conyers. And every time I was in that office, it felt like home to me. Um, and I imagine it felt that way for a ton of other congressmen and congresswomen who had known him for years. They know what he stands for. He's all about human rights. He's all about women's rights. Social justice. Uh, so many things. And, and to just piggyback on what Arnold is saying, many of those people, he would, you know, go to, to bat for it. He, he would stick his neck out for it at all costs. So to not have that reciprocated, you know, like Arnold said, it was just shocking. Did he ever say anything to you about how disappointed? We had conversations. What I won't go say? into the details of those, but you know, it was it was it was heartbreaking for him, somewhat traumatic in ways, um, because you think you know a person, and then to see, and and some of them that didn't stand up for him actually spoke out against him. So for him to um, 
you know, be on the receiving end of that, you know, you can only imagine what was going through his mind. And like I said, we did have some very detailed conversations about it. And, you know, it was just deeply disappointing. You also were very fortunate to be part of the law firm with your dad um, that successfully represented him, was able to get a lot of affidavits from people who uh, basically called these, uh, these Me Too individuals, three of them, liars, right? What did it mean to you when you saw that his legacy was preserved? Well, I was very proud of my father for his representation of Congressman Conyers. My father is a fighter, and he is always going to do what he deems is best for his clients, which is to always be a zealous advocate. Um, and just seeing how he was able to persevere, especially under immense scrutiny from the media, was just a great learning experience for me. And to see him stand up and stay strong was very inspiring. Um, the media was very unkind to him for a stretch of months, you know, attacking him left and right. And something that uh, I don't think a lot of people understand is that the role of a lawyer is to protect your client. And this is a constitutional duty. You are innocent until proven guilty. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't see it that way anymore. And the court of public opinion sometimes is all it takes to take you out. Um, so to see my father stand strong, not only in the actual courtroom, but also the courtroom of public opinion was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the show. And uh, we wish you much success. You'll probably have another case like this mm -hmm. somewhere down the road, right? Yeah. And you learned a lot from it. And uh, thank you for your service. Okay. Oh, you're more than welcome. In these cases where you have high profile people that you represent, there are some slanderous things said against them, libelous things. How do you, what do you say to a client about dealing with the press when people, especially today on social media, can make any kind of comment they want? The first thing is you tell them, don't say anything to the press. And that's from any client we've had, be it R. Kelly, uh, be it Congressman Conyers, be it uh, former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, don't talk to the press. The press is not on your side. Let us handle that for you and follow our advice. That's the simple formula. In other words, the football analogy is give me the damn ball and get out of the way and we handle it for you. And if you listen, we're not gonna guarantee victory, but you're gonna be okay and we'll give it a hell of a fight. Well, apparently the congressman listened to your advice, right? Even though he wanted to talk. Yeah. And why shouldn't he, right? He had nothing to hide, but he listened to the advice. You, you re resolved this successfully and uh, congratulations. The legacy lives on, right? Yes, yes, Thank indeed. You. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.